Well, I became active in the pro-life movement in 1973 with the Roe v. Wade abortion decision. I was 13 years old at the time and um, couldn't really understand what was going on in our society that all of a sudden we would be allowing the killing of innocent children. And I don't know why, but for whatever reason, the Lord placed a burden on my heart at that time and it's never gone away to speak out for the cause of life. Well, I'd been involved in the Rights Life movement for, for a number of years, and I knew about abortion and infanticide and euthanasia, but I really wasn't aware of how much anti-life forces had permeated into our healthcare industry and actually advocating for a healthy woman, disabled, but a healthy 41-year-old woman to be starved and dehydrated to death. And I felt there was a lot of misinformation out there and people didn't know what the truth was. And at first I went down to support the family for spiritual reasons. And then as I got to know the family, began speaking out uh, clearly for her right to life. Um, when she was 26 years old, um, we were not exactly sure what happened, but something happened to her that caused her to go into a brain injured state. And she was able to um, respond to simple yes and no questions. She was responding to physical therapy, but at a certain point her estranged husband decided he didn't want her to have any further treatment and felt it was all useless. And so the parents began um, kind of this inner family battle for her rehabilitation. Um, and the husband was against it. And she died because she had all water and food withdrawn. Correct. Um, she um, went 13 and a half days without food or water. Well, I'm a relatively a newcomer to social media and surfing the internet and one day I was just surfing the internet and I saw this story about um, a 13 month old baby who um, the hospital took the parents to court to stop all life support and I, I read uh, about his case and, and baby Joseph Marachli had a undiagnosed neurological illness. Um, he was on a ventilator uh, at a children's hospital and the parents wanted him to gradually be weaned off the respirator and then be allowed to come home and die. They knew he was a sick little boy, but the hospital wanted to give him an injection of morphine and remove the ventilator. And the parents were against that and the hospital took him all the way to the equivalent of our United States Supreme Court and ruled against the family. Um, through a long series of events, um, we were able to fly baby Joseph to Cardinal Glennon's Children's Hospital in St. Louis, Missouri, where they did successfully wean him off the trach, um, um, or off the ventilator, uh, breathing on his own with a tracheotomy and he was able to go home for five months before he died naturally. But he, he died when God intended him to die and not an imposed death. And sometimes people, they say, well, you don't mean they really were gonna give him a shot of morphine and then take off the, the ventilator. And I said, that's exactly what they said they were gonna do. And that was their intent. It meant the world to them, first of all, they, they had been battling doctors, you know, they knew that his life here on earth was short and so they just wanted to spend time to love their son and care for their son and not be tied up with battling doctors and nurses and healthcare professionals. And so it was a great relief to have him weaned off the ventilator to be at home and he was cared for by his parents. Um, and it meant the world to them. And family and friends would come to visit. Um, I was able to come and visit several times before he passed away. And um, we, we had great hope that maybe he would progress longer than 
than he did, but again, it was in, in God's timing and not at the hands of doctors. And, 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 and when you think about it, it's, it's so cruel for, for an institution to say, your child will be put to death at this time, at this date, and, and you're absolutely helpless without any rights. Well, you know, for, for a lot of our society, they, um, I, I heard it said somewhere that um, we're living in a society that's run by nuns. And when I think of run by nuns, I think of the, the veiled women in religious life. And it really means um, when people are asked the question, what's your religious affiliation, it's none. And when you are not grounded in faith, you lose perspective of what's really important in life. And I think that we're living in a society that offers death as a solution, and they don't see the positive life-affirming things that can be done for people, even in tragic circumstances, that could be possibly the best thing that happens to them in their life. Um, a family being brought closer together because they have a child with special needs. Um, sad to say, a lot of our families today are dysfunctional, there's a lot of issues, a lot of temptations in today's world, and the family is falling apart, and then a special needs child comes in the picture, and suddenly there's a whole different outlook, and that child or, or that person um, can change the whole family for the betterment of everybody. And um, so I think that our society doesn't recognize the value of each human life. And people don't understand that, yes, you can have a great, um, intelligent, uh, prosperous person, somebody that grows up to be President of the United States or the Holy Father, and their life, yes, will be important, but a child with Down syndrome or chronic cerebral palsy or some other type of illness could achieve just as high a level of good for the world in their condition. And that's seeing it through the, the hands of God or the eyes of God rather than the eyes of man. Well, Brother Michael, um, he was 33 years old. Um, he contracted a sudden um, bacterial pneumonia he didn't know he had. Um, it caused him to go into cardiac and respiratory arrest and I found him in his bedroom uh, clinically dead. He had no pulse, had no heartbeat, was gray in color and did CPR and, and was unsuccessful in reviving him. Uh, the paramedics came to the house and they were successful and um, he was taken to the Hennepin County Medical Center and we were told his situation was grave. And at the time, um, I was greeted by a, a trauma room nurse who um, I, I just asked, was he going to live? Uh, and she told me that if she, he did live, he would be a vegetable for the rest of his life. And would I really want that for my friend? And so right away within literally a minute of being in the emergency room, my friend went to being reduced to a head of lettuce or a stock of celery or a carrot. You know, it's just the humanity was gone. And, um, but we fought for his life. Um, interestingly enough, some of his same doctors were the doctors that treated Terry Schiavo. So, uh, but of course, Brother Michael was many years earlier and um, we eventually were able to bring him home and care for him at home and felt that um, he's a child created in the image and likeness of God and he should be cared for the way anyone else should be cared for. And we were told um, six weeks after the, his original pneumonia assault, um, he developed another bout of pneumonia and the doctors told us they were perfectly fine not treating him. And I thought to myself, no, we want him treated. If, if 
this was an elderly person or if this was a teenager with Down syndrome or somebody, we, we, we would want them treated. Why not treat him? But already there was kind of this mark against him that would kind of follow through uh, the rest of his life uh, until he did die in 2003. But for us in caring for him, I think first of all, we learned we could do things that we didn't think we could do. You know, people, um, they think of caring for a loved one. Oh, I could never do that. For me, I, I've always been squeamish at the sight of blood. I never thought I'd be able to, to be around people, um, that there would be needles or anything like that. And then a few years later, it's the topic of the dinner conversation and, and it becomes a part of your way of life when you're caring for somebody and, and it's, it's really a matter of love. You know, if, if you love someone, you care for them, it's not a burden and uh, it changed all of our lives. I think it made us more compassionate, more caring, um, better human beings and I think a lot of people were touched by Brother Michael's life just being in his presence, that there were no great miracles performed, there was, there was nothing extraordinary other than um, people felt a sense of peace. And I, I remember my own father, um, he had had a, a quintuple heart bypass surgery, it was his fifth surgery. He had two strokes, um, he had a pacemaker defibrillator put in. He was on dialysis. Um, he was in very poor health and he came up to visit me and, and saw Brother Michael and he said, I'll never complain again because he saw the value of his life but what Brother Michael was going through and people, um, you know, felt very comforted by being in his presence. Well, I think very honestly, myself included, we have been catechized more by Hollywood and the media than we have through the church and actual factual science. And I think we need to get back to the basics in what it means to care for a sick person or a disabled person and not buy into the, the so-called political correct uh, speak of the day. Um, for example, quality of life. Well, all of us want to have a good quality of life, but quality of life is not a gospel value. You know, Jesus himself didn't have the best quality of life and, and, and suffered, and, and people need to understand that that's not a gospel value. And sometimes when you have certain situations that challenge us, um, it, it can bring about a greater good. And so I think not caving into the political speak of today's day and age, um, you can alleviate suffering. There's all kinds of ways to alleviate suffering. And sometimes uh, giving a person 10 minutes of the time of day is more um, potent than any narcotic that you would give someone. And sometimes People's spirituality is very important to them, so just praying with them gives them the comfort to go on, to know that there's someone else caring. Um, and there's all types of different therapies beyond just the, the normal um, uh, medical things that you can do to alleviate suffering. And I truly believe that there is really no reason for people to suffer in today's day and age um, physically, but it can be that emotional or psychological. And sometimes it's harder on us, the caregivers, than the person themselves. And it was now St. Uh, John Paul II that said, you know, euthanasia is kind of a false mercy and a false compassion because it's killing the person who's suffering we can't bear, not that they can't bear. And um, I've been with many, many people that those final weeks and those final days have been the most quality time in their life or in their marriages or in their relationship 
with with their kids and so well and our, our society is really one that was based on judeo-christian values that said all life is sacred and and that it is to be cared for it and nurtured and protective and that only God has the right um, to take a life. And so that's grounded in, in, in the scriptures and it's grounded in, in the very fabric of our society. But I think over the course of time, things have gotten blurred and people have come up with kind of a new theology or a new spirituality or a new way to care for people. And they need to get back to the basics because we're all created in the image and likeness of God, and we are the temples of the Holy Spirit. We are to be cared for and nurtured, and each one of our lives is precious in the eyes of God. If, if, if God created the universe and we were the only person here, he loves us so much, each individual, that he would still send his son Jesus Christ in the world and to suffer and to die for us because that's how much he loves each person that he's created. And so all life has value. And I think we have to, to really um, challenge ourselves because sometimes there can be a, a hypocrisy even within our own churches, um, where you, you would say, oh, please, you know, your child might have a, a genetic disease, but don't abort your child, don't, don't have an abortion, will help you, and you, you have the finances and the, the care offered, and then yet once that child's born, the parents might have to struggle to two different jobs, three different jobs, finding people to be with their children because you're not like any other parent. You have a special needs child that needs special care. You can't just leave them with anybody. And where does that support come from? And um, people fail to realize we have to provide tangible, life-affirming uh, solutions to help people because life is a continuum. And again, that. Who are we to judge? I know people say that all the time, but whether a child lives a few moments or a few years, who are we to judge the quality of that life and, and the good that can be achieved in that life? That If, if it's a young child um, born into a family, that might be the defining moment that, that saves that family, uh, that brings them together. and so. I just think we really need to get back to the basics and care for each human being. And it's not, you know, you hear a lot today about extraordinary care and ordinary care and all this, this stuff, but it's what's helping the person, you know, and what a cold compress to somebody's forehead or holding them or rocking them in a chair or holding somebody's hand or reading them a story or a, for a child, a bunny rabbit crawling on the bed, you know, those things provide love and comfort. And, and who are we to judge to say that that has no value for somebody? Well, I think there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, when you talk about people with disabilities may need to be on a feeding tube and you think, oh, that's such an extraordinary amount of Cost and it's, it's really very simple <laughs> compared to what it is to go into a grocery store and providing three meals a day for, for your loved one. It's really about equal. So it's, it's, there's a lot of misinformation. Again, I think we've been, our vision has been skewed by the media and about a lot of uh, misinformation. I, I think that I find it particularly frustrating that people that would align themselves with a faith tradition, um, a tradition that, got, that upholds gospel values and the sacredness of human life, can grasp it when it comes to that preborn child in the womb, but somehow to see a 42-year-old woman that maybe has to have 
um, uh, towel under her chin because she drools, that that's just too unbearable for them to think about and they can advocate withdrawing food and hydration. That disconnect has been troubling and so um, I think trying to, to teach people, you, you have to embrace the full gospel of life, not just a part of it, and that um, you don't know how you'll feel at every step along the way. How you look at things when you're 20 is much different than how you look at things when you're 50. And how you look at things when you're 70 is much different than when you were 50. And sometimes, um, you know, people will make statements, oh, I'd never want to live my life in a wheelchair. And then all of a sudden, being in a wheelchair or a motorized wheelchair gives them a new freedom in life, and it's, it's a, a wonderful thing. So you don't always know until you're there. Um, and so I think we have to be careful not to make blanket universal statements. I would never want feeding tubes or I would never want to be on a ventilator. Because sometimes these treatments are just bridges to get us from one point to another. It can allow um, a grandparent to see their grandchild walk down the aisle and get married. It can, it can allow a couple to celebrate a 50th wedding anniversary, or it could allow a father to see his first child be born, you know. So all of those things have meaning. Well, for me, um, when someone is in a crisis situation, or they're in a situation where they've received either some bad news or or uh, in the case of having a child that's going to have special needs, um, to realize these are real people, these are real human beings with real emotions, and this is a vulnerable, vulnerable time in their life. And that the, um, the, the kind of statements that are just cliches that we spewed out every so often just really aren't appropriate, that we need to realize that we're talking about somebody's child, we're talking about a family, we're talking about uh, maybe shattered dreams and, and people need time to heal and they need support and comfort rather than the cliches. And then to also to provide that support that, you know, when we encourage a, a woman not to abort her child, in this day and age we can go to almost any neighborhood go into a crisis pregnancy center and find help and support to help this woman carry her baby to term. Well, we need to apply those same resources and that same energy to people that find themselves in a difficult situation where a loved one has a catastrophic illness or, or maybe has a few hours or a few days to live. How do we support them? And, and that's what we need to do, is comfort them and not pretend that their child's life or their loved one's life doesn't matter, because every life matters. Well, I think, you know, with the, our society right now, unfortunately, has made our physicians and our healthcare providers into becoming executioners at times, to whereas, um, they think that um, terminal sedation or sedation is the best thing in, in helping a child um, that may be dying or any person that's dying. And I think that um, there, there's a lot of, again, mistruths that are out there. Um, dying is a part of life and um, there's ways to comfort those who are dying in, in very loving, caring, humane, Christian ways. But to, to over-sedate someone so it suppresses their breathing and it hastens that death, it pushes that death to happen so much sooner, it, it's wrong because it, it's playing, it's literally taking life in your own hands. It's playing God. And how do you know when death will occur? Doctors are not always right. Um, they're not soothsayers. They're, they can't perform magic. And 
how do you know someone um, will not live? And it, they may live for a few more months or a few more years, but that's the danger is when somebody says, okay, we're gonna help this person now by terminal sedation, they, they will never have been given that chance. And um, so there's a lot of great dangers out there, um, especially um, in the hospice movement. Hospice started off as something very good. And, and in the um, uh, 1980s and 1990s, um, when we didn't know what AIDS was, um, um, I was involved in, in running a hospice unit and, and cared for people that were dying. So I, I have some background in that. But um, it's important to love the person and care for the person and not, again, just go with all this political correctness because a lot of it, it we've been sold a bill of goods. And sad to say, you know, it's um, um, like, you know, people that, that are born with Down syndrome. And uh, I've seen cases where um, there's a 40 year old Down syndrome man uh, came down with cancer. And um, uh, it was, it, it affected his ability to swallow and to have food. And so, uh, the parents wanted him to have a feeding tube just for comfort care, you know, just, um, but because he was in hospice, they weren't gonna do that, and it's battling the situation. And they just wanted to provide enough strength to have chemotherapy to reduce the tumor so that he could die more comfortably. And so, because he was a Down syndrome person, I, I witnessed firsthand how that discrimination still exists today um, and there are people out there deciding whose life is valuable and whose life isn't and yeah my thing and it's kind of hard hard to say it sometimes because you know there's a lot of good pro-life doctors out there and you know there's a lot of good uh, health care professionals and there's people of goodwill that should know better <laughs> And, and yet we fall into this trap of um, really making ignorant statements when it comes to life. Uh, and and um, what I have done a lot in the talks I give is I often use my parents as an example because, um, you know, my mother was on a ventilator once, you know, and she made me promise, oh, I'm, if I have to go through that again, don't ever put me on a ventilator again. I never want to get a call from the emergency room. The doctor tells me she's gonna to have to go on a ventilator or she's gonna die. I say, you know, she doesn't wanna go on it. And right then and there, the doctor on the phone says, your mother is indicating she will go on the ventilator. And she went on the ventilator and I flew, you know, to be with her and was at the bedside and um, she was recovering and she turned to me and she said, when they told me I only had two minutes to live, I changed my mind. <laughs> and, and she went on to live and, and, and um, she eventually passed away, but sometimes these are bridges to get better and, and not to make blanket statements, you know, like I never want to or don't ever do this. Because again, you don't, you don't oftentimes know until that very moment. And, that there's no decision that's so important that you usually have to make immediately. Please. Sure, yeah. And there, there are, uh, it's amazing how people, you know, through in, in medical school or in law school, they will make the assumption that if you have a particular genetic disease, all these, you know, infants are dead by the age of two. And then, then you do a quick Google search and you'll see that there are people that are living in their 20s and 30s with this d disease. And so, again, it's misinformation and a lot of people are out there with the wrong set of facts. And th that's uh, an uphill battle. Um, one of the things that, that um, 
I really believe in is that every person, if they have someone that has some type of chronic illness or disability, needs a medical advocate. And uh, I, I kind of laugh because when Brother Michael was living, every time he went to the hospital, I was there and I was asking the questions. And after a couple of years, if there was a new doctor, they asked if I was a physician or they asked if I was an RN because I was asking all the right questions to make sure that he got the treatment that he needed. And that's almost what you have to do today is you have to have a medical advocate, uh, someone that's going to stand by that patient and help them. And to be willing to ask the questions and to be willing to real. There used to be a per certain professions that you never question. You never question a minister or priest because of their relationship to God, and you never question a doctor. And today, it's okay to question both when it comes to saving human life. Okay. <laughs> well, um, I really, really value um, prenatal partners for life, and I think what's strikes me the most is the care that they give, not just the child, but the parents. Because if you ever truly love someone and they're in this condition, your heart aches for them. And to have somebody there really literally putting an arm around you or giving you a hug or giving a word of encouragement, that, uh, that's what I value is the sincerity and the love that exists within the organization. Terry Shivo, Brother Michael, Pope John Paul, now Saint John Paul II, 